Check out monorail.com, America's affordable investment app made for conservatives who want to keep their hard-earned money with companies that share their value. Download the Monorail app today. Join Monorail. I was very, very touched just now, and I think I'd like to share it with you folks. Sean, in a, in, in a rare emotional moment, said to me, have a good show. And I'm a little overwhelmed. I want to. I just want to say that. Hi, everybody. I'm Dennis Prager. I have a very provocative topic for you. You know, I think about the big stuff. I've been thinking about the big stuff since the age of 14. In, in as I think as a sophomore in high school, I wrote a paper on is there an afterlife. And I, uh, not a paper, what we used to call composition, I think they'd call it essay now. And I wrote in my junior year a uh, an essay f- for my English class. And the subject was, I want to prove George Bernard Shaw wrong. <laughs> Did you know about this one? I'm laughing because it shows I really, uh, I marched to a different drummer from a very early age. And what did, what it, was it about George Bernard Shaw that I wanted to prove wrong? He said, it's too bad youth is wasted on the young. And I said, I want to prove him wrong. I will not waste my youth while I'm young. And I didn't. I mean, I, I played a lot. I still play a lot. But uh, that was that was a very formative time. It's when I taught myself how to conduct orchestras. It's when I started teaching myself Russian. I was a very atypical child, as you would imagine. My parents had no idea who was living uh, in the same home. <laughs> My mother really did at times think I would end up in jail. And the reason, or a reason, was that I never did homework, which in a Jewish home is definitely grounds for imprisonment. (laughs) All right, welcome to the show here. So I am preoccupied this week with the question of what what are Judeo-Christian values? It's the it's my column this week, and it was what I recorded for PragerU yesterday. You know, we've been putting out for 10 years or so, uh, every single week, a video. I uh, Of the 500 that we've put out, I've done 50, so I only do one in 10, but that, still, it's a lot. And th- I have just recorded what are Judeo-Christian values and I am going to bounce some themes off you. Very few people who use the term know exactly what they mean. They they know more or less what they mean. It, it's it's not at all a, a dishonest statement or u- usage of a term. But what does it really mean? And why Judeo Christian? Why not just Christian? Or why not just Judaic, for that matter? So I have a thoughts for you, and if you're Christian or Jewish or neither, you will find all of this interesting and provocative. Judaism and Christianity are the only two religions that share a holy scripture. That's very interesting. And again, it's not something people think about. They know it. But they don't think about it, and they don't realize it's unique. So take, for example, the other monotheistic religion, Islam. Islam does not share a holy scripture with Judaism or Christianity. In fact, it is basic to Islamic belief that the Jews distorted the, the Old Testament, especially the Torah, the key, the key five books of Moses, and that Christians uh, made up their own New Testament, and that the the only authentic word of God is the Quran. It's not a criticism in the least. It's just a statement of fact. So there, that's why one does not speak of Judeo-Muslim or 
uh, Muslim or Christ, Cristiano Muslim values. That's not to say that a Muslim and a Christian and a Jew cannot share some values. Of course they can. But uh, a Muslim and a, and a excuse me a, a a Jew and a Christian could share values with a with a Hindu and with a Buddhist and with an atheist. They don't share theologies or beliefs, but they can share values. Uh, uh, that, that's that's given. If you believe in free speech, you share a value, right? Right. So, n- the n- number one thing in understanding Judeo-Christian is to understand that they do share a Bible. The, that Bible is the Old Testament, as Christians came to call it, uh, or the Hebrew Bible. Jews call it the Tanakh. It doesn't matter what you call it. I'll refer to it as alternately the Old Testament and the Hebrew Bible. That's what they share, both traditionally holding that it reflects or is, in fact, the Word of God. That's a very big reason to say Judeo-Christian. Now here, however, is a very interesting challenge to Christians and especially those who uh, sometimes say, and you can read it in comments on my column, for example, on American Greatness, one of the wonderful websites that that prints, if that's the term you can use, my column every week. So, I'm sorry? Publishes. Publishes? Yeah, that's the, that's the new term? Yeah. They use publish? That's fascinating. That's an old term. So... Uh, I read comments, not only on my columns. I did a whole male-female era yesterday on New York Times readers' comments on a column on uh, on, on men and women. So I, I find reading comments at least as educational as reading the piece. So there are comments sometimes by Christians who will say that uh, there's no such thing as Judeo-Christian, and there are Jews who say this. There's no such thing as Judeo-Christian values. They're, they're completely different religions. And, of course, they, they, they're not completely different. They are different. Of course they're different. Completely different? How can you share a, a, a very large chunk of Bible as divine writ and not share a lot? However, there are Christians who don't realize the Judeo part is valid. They will, they will say it, and they will intuit it, but they will not realize it. And I, I did a little experiment right before I came on just now. I googled, love God with all your heart. And what comes up? The very, very first thing that comes up, Matthew 6.21. I have no issue with that. Whoops. Oh, God, it drives me crazy. Okay. Matthew 6, 21. And then it has Luke 10, uh, Matthew 22, and, and so on. It, it, okay. It's a very interesting thing because it's actually originally a thousand years before the New Testament, in the Old Testament, in the Torah. The first five books, the most important books to Jews of the Bible, and it's the most important, they are the most important books. That's why I'm writing my my Bible commentary on those five books. So, uh, if uh, here's a question for my Christian listeners. If I were... If I'd have asked you five minutes ago or five years ago, where does love God with all your heart come from? Would you have said New Testament or Old Testament? No, you could say, or or both Testaments. You could say that too. But I am, I suspect that many Christians believe that it is unique to the New Testament. Likewise, love your neighbor as yourself. And that, too, comes from the Torah, from the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus also gave us the one verse that is on the Liberty Bell. For these reasons alone, it, it, it is extremely fair to say Judeo-Christian. 
the Christian part, for Jews who, who may have issues with the term, is that Christianity brought the Jewish scriptures to the world. That, that's overwhelmingly true. That's why Jews and Christians need each other. And there has been one major Judeo-Christian country, the United States of America. Will it remain? It doesn't look like it right now. And that is the reason for the, uh, the collapse. People say men give birth and other absurdities, I mean true lying absurdities, because they have abandoned the idea that there is objective truth and objective right and wrong. 1A Prager 776 877 243 776. Every day when I pass a mirror, I still can't believe it. It's me! I'm looking back at myself. I never thought I'd be this fit again, but 42 pounds ago, I decided to take control of my health. And with the help of my PhD weight loss and nutrition, I'm so glad I did. The program is simple. Dr. Ashley Lucas and her amazing team customize a plan for your body to make it simple. They even provide 80% of your food at no additional cost. They treat your entire person as one. Dr. Ashley believes that all change starts with the mind. She'll help you to change your behavior when it comes to food and think differently about food so you'll never gain the weight back. Give them a call right now at 864-644-1900 and they can answer all your questions. If I can do it, you can do it. Okay, so I'm talking to you about Judeo-Christian values and how important they are. What Christianity did, among other things, is bring the Judeo to the world. That's a big deal. So Jews should certainly understand Judeo-Christian values. Christians should understand that the values that they preach are overwhelmingly Old Testament-based, and of course... uh, uh, enunciated and and enhanced, if you will, from a Christian standpoint, certainly, uh, in the in the New Testament. But I, I did a little experiment here. I put in "Love God with all your heart," and all I got were New Testament references on Google. But of course, it comes from the Old Testament. So does "Love your neighbor as yourself." So does "Love the stranger." So. Uh, If any Christian has ever had a problem with Judeo-Christian values, it's because they are ignorant of the Old Testament. And it it is an interesting question. If you're a Christian, when you, if you got a Christian education, was it both Testaments or was it overwhelmingly New Testament? I have seen Bibles handed out by missionaries which only have the New Testament in them. And it's... It doesn't make sense to me from a Christian standpoint, not not just not just from a an objective standpoint. One eight Prager seven seven six, and again I, I remind you the the only two religions to share holy scripture are Judaism and Christianity. That's a very big deal. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Chris in Anaheim, California. Hello. Yes, uh, Dennis. I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you. Um, what I what I just find astonishing, really, is that you the Christians that you associate with apparently um, believe that that uh, you've got to go to only the New Testament. Um, the, the the Old Testament is the foundation for the New Testament, but then um, you know. Another statement that you make is that um, Christianity leads you back to the Torah. Um, but I, I would like to make, you know, I, I don't know how I can make this argument with you so quickly, but, um, but the New Testament uh, supersedes the Old Testament in your relationship with God. And, and the Old Testament was nailed to the cross. And so to go back to the Old Testament would be doing the exact opposite of what God wants you to do. 
And you, by um, not believing in the New Testament and the and Christ as the Savior now, you're actually denying entry into heaven. Oh, sorry, it broke up. Dying, denying what? I didn't hear the last words. Uh, denying access to heaven. Because you've got to believe that Jesus is God in the flesh and gave himself on the cross to save you from your sins. Right. Okay. Uh, and you uh, do you, not you, get that from going back to the Torah. Right. That I agree with that. You, you don't get that from going back to the Torah. So what you're doing, and perfectly legitimately, is enunciating a Christian theology. I don't know where we differ beyond that. We, we differ on, on the nature of salvation. For Judaism, it is through deeds, through Christianity, it's through faith. Although my wife was raised evangelical, and the emphasis on behavior, which is another issue entirely, and I, I ought to do an hour on that. I think Christians do themselves a disservice when when they say it's all faith, as Luther did. Luther said, e even if, if you murder and, and do a whole host of other things, it doesn't matter. Salvation is only through faith. But L Luther is a mixed bag as an individual, but he certainly did something remarkable in creating the Protestant Reformation, which is another subject as well. My subject today is not to say who's right. I have I've never even I've never addressed that because God will answer that question. What is what matters is what Jews and Christians can do as serious Jews and serious Christians to save Western civilization from the vile internal attacks on it from the left. That, to me, is the single most important question that we can ask, not who's right. Ju ju God will adjudicate on that. What I know is who's wrong. The left is wrong. The left is a completely destructive force because it has rejected the values of both our religions. Even though there are leftist Jews and leftist Christians, there's a leftist pope. I understand that. Leftism goes everywhere and it ruins everything it touches. That is what th I think our focus needs to be now. Because if the, if the society collapses, we, we have sinned against our children and grandchildren. You, what, did your, uh, what did your father and, or mother or grandfather or grandmother do to save the freest society ever developed in history. And the answer, went to synagogue or went to church, won't suffice. Those of you who love God must hate evil. That's in the Psalms for both of us, Christians and Jews. By the way, I'll be talking about all of this with Eric Metaxas on Monday in Pasadena. Ask a Jew, ask a Gentile. Info is at DennisPrager.com. Hi everybody, Judeo-Christian values is my topic. Read my column today, it's, it's out, it's, it comes out every Tuesday, you can see it at DennisPrager.com. American Greatness, Town Hall, Daily Wire, Jewish Press, J Jewish World Review, it's, thank God, it's widely republished. See, I used the word published not printed. It's also printed, but mostly published. So I've been thinking about this a lot. For those of you who have any ambivalence about the term, please understand the only two religions to share Holy Scripture are Judaism and Christianity, and that is the Old Testament, which for Christians is the bulk, of, certainly quantitatively, the bulk of the Bible. I, so I did another experiment. I told you I Googled, love God with all your heart. 
and what I got was the first thing, Matthew 6.21, then Luke 10.27, and on and on. No reference at all to Deuteronomy, only New Testament references. And then I did love your neighbor. That's all I put in, love your neighbor. Mark 12.31, and Romans 13.8-10, Mark 12.30. Matthew twenty two thirty four. Not a single reference uh, comes up to the original source, which is Leviticus. It's a very interesting experiment that I just did. Never did it before. Okay, let's see here. Pittsburgh, one of my favorite cities. Susan, hello, Susan. Hi, Dennis. It's great to to be talking with you. Thank you. You. Oh, you were an uh, inspiration to me. Good. We um, have a woman's Bible class that I've been participating in. It's very small. And we were looking for a new subject to study. And I did not want to hear one more screeching woman talk about vapid studies on videos that we've been working with that are out there in the marketplace, which is interesting. Um, we also have a tendency in our church to be doing uh, anti-racism kinds of studies. Mm-hmm. And so... Everybody was discussing all these things at our, our small table, and I said, how about this? How about if we do Deuteronomy, I'll lead the study? Because I knew I had your book as my backup. Go on. And so I've been doing that. We're on our sixth week, and uh, the first week we got through the first 11 verses, and it was really quite a beautiful and inspiring conversation. And we're all the way up into, right now, the uh, Ten Commandments. And um, this coming week, we're going to be doing the two on um, on uh, murder versus killing, and the other one about false witness. And, well, you um, have, from... look, th- this is what I, I live for, that, that people read my rational Bible commentary. Mm-hmm. That's why I've devoted so much of the last 10 years to it. And, mm-hmm. uh, if people understand these books, th- their lives will be better. The world will be better. I can't thank you enough. How are they reacting, your your small group? Uh, very, very well. Uh, I thought we were going to skim right through. We actually read Oh, the, it's they're very hard to skim my Bible commentary. <laughs> I, I will no, say actually, that. Right. Yeah. We're actually reading... We're reading Deuteronomy and using yours as a backup, oh, uh, you know, going to the original Yes, text. I hear you. Well, of course, that's the way yeah. to do it. Well, thank you so much. That's great. So I just need, I'm very open, as you all know, about my life. And uh, as one caller put it, I'm, a, I'm transparent. I, I intend to be. It's, so I'm sitting here in Los Angeles, and a woman in Pittsburgh has a group studying my commentary on Deuteronomy. That's a very good feeling. It's zero ego. Nobody writes commentaries on Deuteronomy for ego reasons. I can promise you that. Frank in Atlanta, Georgia, hello. Hello there, Dennis. Uh, God bless you and for all that you do. Thank you, he has. Uh, and I wanted to speak about uh, what you said about uh, love God with all your heart and how some Christians uh, don't don't even recognize that as coming from the Old Testament. Uh, and when I study, and I have my Bible open right now to that very verse, um, Google must be your problem because uh, when you look at the uh, foot in the text itself, it tells you exactly where these. Uh, these, these yes, verses. hold on, hold on. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you why I address it aside from Google. Many investment advisors have been recommending cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. They claim it's the new gold. This is Dennis Prager for AmFed Coin and Bullion. Why would you buy the new gold when you can buy real gold and silver, which have maintained value for thousands of years versus the highly volatile crypto market? When I purchase gold and silver, I do so from my friend, and I don't often say my friend in these ad copies, Nick Grovich, owner of AmFed Coin and Bullion. I like the fact that it's tangible. I can hold it and control how it's stored, unlike digital currency that's held in a digital wallet. 
I want to preserve my wealth, which is far from the case with Bitcoin spiraling drop in price. Nick's been in the precious metals industry for over 41 years, and he has established a reputation built on trust, transparency, and fair pricing. Call Nick and his team at Amfed Coin and Bullion to take advantage of his honest advice and extensive expertise. 800-221-7694. AmericanFederal.com. AmericanFederal.com. Hi, everybody. The following hour is dedicated to a truly foolish statement. (laughs) I wish I had some of the examples right in front of me, but I don't. But every one of you has heard some politician, and it's usually a politician who says, or maybe some columnist, although I think it's more politicians. Americans have much more in common than that which divides them. Or a very a variant of that, or a variation, if you will, is it's the politicians who uh, differ with one another. The average American... No, they don't. The average Americans, they they don't really differ that much from their fellow Americans. Or Barack Obama's famous line: "There's no blue America or red America, just the United States of America." And people cheer. Anyway, he he could have said that he'll fundamentally transform the United States of America, and people would share cheer. We are five days yeah. away oh, I guess he from did. fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Ah, yes. Nice middle-class American whites cheering the idea of fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Where did he say that? I always forget. That, uh, it wasn't Denver. We, we heard him in Denver yeah. at I, the I, gigantic... I think he said that. I'm not sure. Was it? In Chicago, but it was a few mm-hmm. days Really? I don't know. Well, it was outdoors. Yeah. All right. Anyway. No. no. How could it be? It's five days before the election. Sean, you deserve the punishment room. We don't have elections in June. Okay. Sean. Sean is now. Okay. He is so embarrassed. You know. His beard is turning I'm to learn to be more professional. Now, if you don't understand why Sean is being punished, it's because he said in my earphones something wrong, which is very bad because then I might repeat it thinking he knew what he was talking about, because he usually does. So that is the reason for those of you curious. So yes, there are no red states or blue states, just the United States. Americans have far more in common than they have, which divides them. All these cliches, now, by the way, a lot of cliches are true. The fact that something is a cliche just means it's so overused or used that much. But then there are cliches that are not true. That's called pablum. (laughs) So that is the topic of my hour. If you believe that, you believe pablum. Here here is just an example (laughs) I'm going to give you an example of uh, of the uh, of the latest example. Okay, this is really uh, this is a winner. This is the, if this doesn't convince you, uh, not nothing will. This is from the Washington Times. Feds hire that is the federal government hires. Echo grief trainers to help employees cope with, quote, loss in the natural world. The Interior Department's Fish and Wildlife Service is offering echo grief, that's ecological grief, training to employees who are struggling with a sense of trauma or loss as they witness a changing environment. Now, if you are grieving 
over Mother Earth being destroyed by climate change induced by flatulating cows and humans, we, you and I, have nothing in common, or very little. We both breathe, we both eat, we both sleep. I'm not talking about biological commonalities. The class will give staffers a chance to define what they mean by ecological grief. Space. Ah, space. That's like safe. Safe and space. Oh, yeah, no safe spaces. It's a movie I'm in. Space to examine their emotional reactions and tools to grapple with those feelings. The agency said in a note to employees in the southwest region where the training is offered. Those who go up, those who sign up will will be led to, quote, find ways to act while caring for themselves. All right, well, there's more to it, but I'm not going to, we're not addressing that particularly. I'm addressing the question Do you believe that Americans have more in common than what separates them? 1-8 Prager 776. It is nonsense. It is is as nonsense. That statement is as nonsensical as men menstruate. The division in this country is profound and deep. If you think this country is systemically racist, and I know you're wrong and you think I'm a bigot for saying that, what the hell do we have in common? Right? If you uh, Staying on race. If you think that having a, an all-black dormitory on a college campus is a good thing, an all-black graduation exercise at a college is a good thing, and I think it's a racist, vile thing, what do we have in common? If you think Black Lives Matter is a moral, fine, kind movement, and I think it is utterly nihilistic, what do we have in common? If you think that defunding the police is good for society, what do we have in common? The the list is gigantic. 1-8 Prager 776 The reason for this subject is clarity. Living in a make-believe world of lies, there are no red states or blue states, just the United States, and having people clap because they really want that to be true, I want that to be true too. However, I grew up at a very early age and distinguished between what I want and what is real. When you can't distinguish between what you want and what is real, you have decided to remain a child. I want there to be a a much more agreement among Americans. I grew up in an America that had such much more agreement. Nobody, most, most Americans didn't care if you were a Republican or a Democrat when I grew up. So what? You're a Democrat, I'm a Republican. You're a Republican, I'm a Democrat. Big deal. Let, let's, let's, uh, let's get together with the families. Let's have, let's have a barbecue. That's not true now. If you go to on, you go on, uh, what do they call them? Uh, not match sites. What do they call Dating sites, yeah. You go on dating sites, there are many women in particular who will say, uh, if you are conservative or a Republican or like Trump, don't don't bother responding. By the way, they're not wrong. Ironically, they are they agree with me. Our differences are so immense now that it is pointless for us to have a date. I I uh, believe it or not, a lot of conservative singles tell me about that. And they find it somewhat uh, offensive. But I, I got to say, I don't find it offensive. I find it time-saving. Why would you want to date somebody who thought that way, that if you're a Republican, you hate black people? What do you have in common with such a human being? Nothing. 
One eight Prager seven seven six eight seven seven two four three triple seven six. Okay, yeah. See, so he feels bad, and he should. Where, where was it? That's the question. Not when was it. It was obvious when it was. It. It. Oh God. All right. It's not his day. It took place in a city. All I want to know is what city that was. It's not that important, but since you raised it in my earphones, I am responding aloud. This is a very important subject. The The differences are the greatest essentially since the Civil War. And I have argued that Americans actually believed in more things in common they had slavery as the gigantic divide, and it is a gigantic divide, just for the record. If you have muscle or joint pain, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you go to relieffactor.com, read about how positive the experiences of so many people have been. At the very least, I suggest that you uh, try it. And they have a, an interesting th- suggestion. Try it, try it for three weeks for nineteen ninety five, $19.95. And they say, if it doesn't work in three weeks, you should, it probably won't work. You should cancel your order. Relieffactor.com. COVIDtaxrelief.org got a small retail business, almost $80,000. COVIDtaxrelief.org got a manufacturing business nearly $250,000. And COVIDtaxrelief.org just got a large distribution business almost $900,000. If you run a business, church, or nonprofit and paid your employees through all or part of the pandemic, you could qualify for up to $26,000 per employee through the government's CARES Act. But beware of clickbait or pay up front companies that make you do the work and take a huge percentage of your refund. COVIDtaxrelief.org receives a low, reasonable commission only after you receive your refund. And with 300 CPAs and tax experts, no one is better at getting you the maximum benefit than COVIDtaxrelief.org. Visit COVIDtaxrelief.org now because this plan expires soon. That's COVIDtaxrelief.org, COVIDtaxrelief.org. Refund examples are not a guarantee and not all businesses qualify. No, I can't stand it. You're running around. You know better, daddy. I can't stand it because you're Hi, everybody. Hour is devoted to telling you the truth. Well, every hour of my show is I'm crazy about the truth. I mean crazy about it. I have visceral hatred of lies. And the the subject is Americans do not have more in common than they don't have in common that there are no blue states or red states, just the United States. I wish it were true. It's it's uh, wishful thinking. Okay, everybody. Let's go to Valparaiso, Indiana, and Scott, hello. Hi, Dennis. Pleasure to talk to you this afternoon. Thank you. I was just... Uh... Boy, just talking about this very same thing with a friend of mine at church over the weekend, and we were just saying and agreeing with each other that the further that our nation drifts from moral truth, the further we will will no longer have things in common. It's sort of like it's the Christmas dinner table. As long as you only talk about sports and music and maybe the weather, everybody gets along. Oh, not the weather. No, 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 no. (laughs) Weather leads you into climate change. Well, that's true. That is true. Um, but the moment you start talking about traditional marriage or protecting the rights of the unborn or the the woke culture that is or, you know the that's influencing our schools, as soon as you start bringing that stuff up, you know the important stuff, then then there's a rift. And unfortunately, I think it's going to be a while until there is more that unites us. Unfortunately. Yes, indeed. I thank you for the call. Look, I don't believe that. You should use Christmas as an opportunity to proselytize for conservative values. 
just for the record. That's not at all my argument here. My argument is that the divisions are are unbridgeable and that it is it is wishful thinking that a mature adult should not be engaged in to say we have more in common than divides us. Take abortion as an example. I, I think I am willing to compromise in order to further the cause of protecting unborn human life, which is what it is, and everybody who wants, any woman who wants the child she is carrying calls it the calls it a baby, right? The manipulation of language is proof that the pro-choice side is dishonest because they call it a baby when they're talking to a pregnant woman, not a pregnant person, by the way, a pregnant woman, and so they will say, how's the baby, no matter what trimester the woman is in. But if, if she doesn't want the baby, then they call it a fetus. It is a fetus. I'm just talking about the term that they use. It's no longer a baby if she doesn't want it. I, mean, I have been thinking about moral issues all of my life. I don't know of any other time where one person determines a moral issue. I mean, think about it. The man who is even her husband or her partner or with whom she had willing casual sex has no say in the matter for reasons that I do not understand. And number two, more important, society has no say. If you think it should die, it dies. It's an amazing thing. Is there any other thing? Well, you can't even do that with a dog. Society has a say in whether a dog can be killed, but it has no say in whether a, a, a human fetus, I'll even use that term, There, there could be, a, 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 there could be civil discussions on this, because th- there are areas of concern that are worthy of addressing on both sides. But if you deny that there is any worth to the human that is not yet born, then the discussion is is pointless. But I wasn't even thinking of abortion. I was using these other examples. If you say that sex is non-binary, that it is okay for, for doctors to remove girls' breasts when they're still in their teen years, if they say they're a boy, what do we have in common? And that's my subject. It is not true there are no red states or blue states, only the United States. It's just not true. I wish it were. Uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Eric, hello. 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 Yes. Hey, can you hear me? Well. Okay, good. Well, I just wanted to say that what we have in common is we're all Americans. I thought that was your deal, your thing. Hmm. Okay, we have that in common, but it doesn't mean we share a single important value, and that's more, more important to me than the geographic fact of living in America? Well, we share a lot of the values of Americans. Yeah, like what? Well, unbeknownst to you, I suppose, that there's a lot of liberals that are go to church. Worship. Okay, you, then, then it's okay, and that, this is not at all a criticism. You probably don't hear me often. I well, have, I a, I have a lot in common with liberals. No, no. I no. say that all the time. The division no. in this country is not liberal conservative. It is left wing and liberal and left wing and conservative. The tragedy is liberals don't acknowledge that. Bill Maher does. 
Alan Dershowitz does, and maybe five others. Hi, everybody. The question on the table is, do you buy the nonsense that Americans have more in common than they have which separates them? And the last caller said, well, they do. And the the example was liberals. So I said politely, you obviously don't hear my show, since every single day of the year that I broadcast, I say that liberals and left have almost nothing in common. The American tragedy is the naivete of the liberal, because they don't understand that they have a, a an existential threat in leftism. The threat to liberalism is not conservatism, it's leftism. Newsweek published my piece. I've just looked it up. I didn't even know Newsweek published it in uh, three, two, two years ago, sorry, not even two years ago. Take Dennis Prager's test. Are you a liberal or a leftist? Just, just Google that. Are you a liberal or leftist? Prager. I have 32 questions that distinguish liberalism from leftism. I, I have a, a lot of anger at the liberal, many of whom are, are really nice people and lead conservative lives. I know them personally. And that is that they are helping to destroy the country as much as the left does, even though they are such nice people. There aren't many nice leftists, but there are nice liberals. I, I, it's it, it's astounding to me that you could be a grown-up liberal and not see the threat that leftism poses to liberalism, whether free speech or America's existence. So the last caller mentioned that they go to church. Well, increasingly they don't, as it happens, but that is true. And the liberal churches and synagogues are disappearing because they either stand for leftism or stand for nothing. Okay, let's go to uh, more calls here. Mm -hmm. Fort Worth, Texas. Paul, hello. Hi, Dennis. Hi. Hey, um... I worked in California for a long time uh, in the construction industry, and as I came up through the ranks, I got to the point as a construction manager where we we handle hundreds of millions of dollars of contracts in critical industri- infrastructure, and it was our job to call the balls and strikes on who was right and who was wrong and what gets paid for an extra. And every single one of my mentors and bosses – and uh, all the people I looked, learned from and respected were, without exception, leftists. Not liberals, but hardcore, anti-Trump, pro-Hillary, you know, all down the line. It was bizarre. So now I've moved to Texas, and the, the situation has completely flipped. Everyone that I work with is a conservative. Right, so the point is? The point is we, ha- we are divided more than ever. Oh, yeah, okay, fair enough. Going to Texas or Florida from California should make that pretty clear. Okay, let's uh, let me see. I took Eric already. That was the last call, so thank you, sir. And let's go to Atlanta and Steve. Hello. Hi, Steve. Uh, Mr. Frager, thanks for taking my call. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. A little while ago, you said that you would not use uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving as a, as a, uh, as a platform to uh, speak to your family and your close, the close folks um, about religion. And I say no. I didn't say no. I didn't say about religion. I just said about politics. Oh, okay. Well, politics is religion in some cases, right? Uh, For instance, 
Um, you know, religion says, okay, stop right there. Religion is politics. So just stop that. <laughs> and, and so, yes, um, if you could use religion to speak about politics, and you, while you have that, um, that, uh, that pulpit, which is, hey, they're in your house eating your food, and they're your family, they trust you because you're a man of God, um, use that pulpit. Absolutely. Well, if, if they trust Every you for you being, a, yeah. If they trust you as a man of God, what if your child? Yeah, of course they do. Of course they do. What does that mean? Of course they're they do. at your house. They're at your house well, because you're their you. parent. No, because you are the one who has done that every Thanksgiving and every Christmas. But you you said something. Really- All right, hold on. I, I'm not following your argument, but I will keep you on. The best-selling Eden Pure Thunderstorm air purifier uses proven oxy technology that quickly destroys viruses, odors, mold, and so much more. With over 265,000 units already sold, you know it works. Works in my house. Any smell will vanish after just a few seconds with the thunderstorm being on. Odors from litter boxes, trash cans, cigarette smoke, dirty diapers, and more are no match. Best of all, no filters are needed. Saves you money and effort. Right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pure Thunderstorm 3-pack for whole home protection. You'll get three units for under $200. Put one in your basement, bedroom, family room, kitchen, or anywhere you need clean, fresh air. The thunderstorm is nearly silent and takes up no floor space. It plugs directly into your wall. Don't breathe dirty air again. Go to EdenPureDeals.com. Put in discount code PRAGER3 to save $200. That's EdenPureDeals.com. Discount code PRAGER3. Three shipping is free. Hello, everybody. Dennis Prager here, and I have a guest. I don't think we've met, at least not on my show, and that's a loss for me. Spencer Clavin, who is uh, someone who uh, is on the young side and believes that we have a great deal to learn from the ancient wisdom of the world, Greek, biblical, and Roman. I think I'm summarizing some of his views. His book is How to Save the West, Ancient Wisdom for Five Modern Crises. And I will read to you what those modern crises are. The reality crisis, outside the cave. Well, no, that's a different one. No, excuse me. The reality crisis, the body crisis, The crisis of meaning, the crisis of religion, and regime crisis. Book is under 200 pages. And I don't know if I should tell you or not that he received his uh, Greek and Latin degree at Yale. Yale's a cesspool, in my opinion, and I, I, I want to get his reaction to my comment. And then he earned his doctorate in ancient Greek literature at Oxford. He's now with the Claremont Institute. Spencer Cleveland, Claven, welcome to the Dennis Prager Show. Dennis, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to talking to you about the cesspool that is uh, Yale, among other things. Okay, so I didn't offend you. No. Well, I, I want to know if you're a Harvard man. I probably should know this, but is that uh, part of the sentiment, or is it just the... No, oh, no, no, sentiment? not in the least. Um, first, yeah. I went to Columbia, which is a cesspool, too, so th- that's not the issue. By the way, now right. that you mentioned that, I since I'm very committed to being as truthful as humanly possible, I don't think that Harvard is uh, has sunk to Princeton's, Columbia's, U of P's, or Yale's. Uh, low, low standards uh, with regard to free speech. I, I would agree with that assessment. I mean, now that we know we're both swamp creatures, I guess we can right. talk about this on an equal footing. But um, yeah, I I feel in my own education often like uh, Telamonian Ajax, who's a character in the in Homer's Iliad. Um, who walks across the prows of ships because he's really big and so he can stride from ship to ship. And sometimes I feel that way about my experience of the academy, but the ships were all kind of sinking behind me um, or even as I was walking across them. So I, you'll get no argument from me about the 
uh, the d decay of the American Academy, the disaster, not just of, of free speech, but I would argue of kind of institutional capital. Oh, of course, of course. And, you know, but, you know. but before we get to your book, uh, I'm curious, what did you experience or what is the case today at Oxford? Well, the I have a, a lot of good things to say about the English system uh, generally and also, you know, vis-a-vis -vis this issue. Um, I, I think that the kind of wave of, uh, I, again, I would call it cultural Marxism, but the wave of this stuff is going to reach everywhere eventually that doesn't uh, take an affirmative stance against it. Uh, I, I don't think that anybody's going to be safe. And you've already, even when I was there, they were talking about things like, you know, tearing down the um, the statue of Cecil Rhodes, uh, for instance, because he was an evil, nasty colonialist who gave all this money to Oxford for scholarships and so forth. And uh, and at that point, the university did come forward and say, no, I'm sorry, we, we don't do this here. We're adults. We don't scream about issues. We, we have conversations about them and, and we honor our past, even with its complexities and its difficulties. So uh, there there's a, a lot. Uh, I mean, there, there are good people left, I think, everywhere in, in all of these uh, universities. There are good professors left everywhere. Uh, but that's not the problem. The problem is institutional capture. And I, I do think it's coming for for all of them. But at this moment, you you would give a, a greater bill of moral and intellectual health to Oxford than to Yale. I think so. Yeah, uh, if okay. that's the yeah. if, it's, if it's a choice between those two. Yeah. All right. I was just curious. So, how to save the West? So, I have. I will be reading your book, and I don't always say this, so just know that. When did it come out? Excellent. By the way, Valentine's Day. So, perfect gift for your sweetheart. Let's Perfect talk gift. about the civilizational oh my God. decline. Every <laughs> wife and significant yep. other is aching. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, so my wife, delight. to be honest, my <laughs> wife, if I said to her, The Greatest Flowers or Spencer Clavin's book on saving the West, I have no <laughs> doubt she would choose your book, just for the oh, record. You're, you're a lucky man. I am. I, I, uh, believe me, everyone who knows my wife knows how true that is. Uh, anyway, is your position, your, your, the big macro position, we are suffering from not studying the great wisdom masters of the past, and part two, would that mean generally Greek, Roman, and biblical? Yes to both, and let me elaborate mm -hmm. a little bit. You know, I think we've been sold a bill of goods. I think we're not just, you know, spontaneously tossing out these great works. I, I think we've been talked out of our cultural patrimony in this regard. I heard you talking at one point about, you know, what divides us. And I talk in this book about crises, which is a word that you hear all the time, you know, crisis of the... Uh, supply chain, uh, COVID crisis, uh, you name it, everything basically feels like a crisis. But the word itself, and here's, you know, the first maybe piece of ancient wisdom we can glean is by studying ancient languages, we we learn that uh, a crisis comes from this this Greek word, krino, to judge, uh, to make a decision. And a crisis, a crisis is a kind of a decision point between two fundamentally irreconcilable ways of looking at the world, understanding the world. And it's my contention in this book that our real crises are not actually about the day-to-day -day news cycle issues, but about those fundamental questions that underlie the news cycle. And yes, it's my argument that uh, the wisdom of the past is the best place to go to Think about how those kinds of fundamental questions have been answered well in, in times before us. And I define the tradition that I'm working in, the tradition of the Western canon, as belonging primarily to Athens and Jerusalem. Uh, those are stand-in words. They're not limited to those two cities. But when you talk about Athens, you talk about the pagan philosophies of ancient Greece and Rome and those civilizations. When I talk about Jerusalem, I'm talking about Jewish scripture and wisdom literature and Christian scripture and wisdom literature as well, the monotheists of the ancient Near East, you might say. And uh, as I suggest in the book, these kind of two streams meet 
in Europe and they make the world that we live in. They're the, they, they become the ground we stand on, the reason that we might even think to criticize our forebears for insufficient morality is usually based on some principle derived from the very tradition that we scorn in, in doing so. So I'm suggesting in the book that uh, there's another way and it comes uh, in, in continuity with this tradition addressing some of these issues we're up against. So I'd like to bounce a theory of mine off you. This is the, why I'm so lucky to have a talk show. I bounce theories off the finest minds in the world. How many people get to do that? Well, I, unfortunately, I'm sorry you couldn't find one today, but I'll <laughs> happily stand, stand in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> oh, wow. I suspect you're Christian. That is such a Christian response because there's such a fear of pride. Oh, self-deprecation. Yes, yeah, yes, our, right, exactly. Our, our bugbear. Okay, yeah. So, no, no, we all know you. What a fine mind you have. So the, the, so I want to bounce this off you. The re A reason that so many don't study the ancient wisdom is is that they they're put into a position of not being great if they were great and even uh. greater than i then who am i but if you if as was said when i was your age don't trust anyone over 30 and that didn't only mean 80 year olds it meant 2000 year olds huh right uh, so I think it's an arrogance that propels the ignorance of of Athens and Jerusalem. Mm, that one feels diminished in the yes. presence of this monster. Diminished <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and by the way, literally so, because they why do they always want something new to say or new to paint or, or, or new mm. to compose? Be because they can't match the, the masters of the past. Mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea, especially when it when it comes to the the fascinating fact that kind of originality as a prime value. Of that's it. That's work it. All right, hold on there. I yeah. want to want to reintroduce the book, How to Save the West: Ancient Wisdom for Five Modern Crises. Crises. Spencer Clavin. I'm back with him in a moment. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better, Mike Lindell with My Pillow is launching the My Pillow 2.0. When Mike invented my pillow, it had everything you could ever want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he discovered a new technology that makes it even better. The My Pillow 2.0 has the patented adjustable fill of the original My Pillow, and now with a brand new fabric that is made with a temperature regulating thread. The My Pillow 2.0 is the softest, smoothest, and coolest pillow you'll ever own. For my listeners, the My Pillow 2.0 is buy one get one free offer with promo code Prager. My Pillow 2.0 temperature regulating technology is 100% made in the USA and comes with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money back guarantee. Just go to mypillow.com and click on the radio listeners square to the buy one get one free offer. Enter promo code Prager or call 800-761-6302 to get your My Pillow 2.0 now. I want it to run. Spencer Clavin's book, How to Save the West, is up at DennisPrager.com. He knows Latin and Greek, and he uses the ancient world to illuminate the modern world in his book, How to Save the West. So I bounced my theory off you, because I, I saw it in the, the field I know best, aside from religion, which is music. Mm. And when they reached an impasse with tonality, they went to atonality, which is an oxymoron. Atonal music is not music. It's a series right. of uh, notes. And the same in, in art, uh, that the there's an, a real avenue now for the non-talented. If you could stand on a ladder and, and throw paint on a canvas, you may end up a, a very wealthy person. Right. And so, if you can schmooze, that's the other important thing. Sorry? And if you can schmooze oh, yeah. appropriately. That, yes, correct. Well said. Well, the painted word is part of the schmoozing, as uh, that, that mm -hmm. famous book. Who wrote that again? 
Um, oh, oh man. You're really testing me. I can't no, no, no. Uh, I know what you mean. No. Wolf. T- yes. Was it Wolf? I was going to. Yeah. I, I should have said I was going to guess Wolf. Yes, yes, yes that's right. Anyway. Okay. Right. So, mm-hmm. by the way, did you learn Greek and Latin? Did you learn Hebrew? I taught myself Hebrew, yes, uh, and the, I was gonna I was gonna mention that I didn't want to toot my own horn. That's but clear, I boy. Use... That is clear. This is like dragging. It's like pulling teeth, getting you to say anything <laughs> good about yourself. <laughs> uh, I'm not here to talk. We're, we're just discussing. I'm not here to talk about myself, but about the great works of the West. But yes, let me let me say, um, you know, I was the reason I was actually going to overcome my shyness and interject that is because when you go to school to study classics now, that means learning Latin and Greek. Uh, one hopes, at least, it, it, it means that. Some places like Princeton doesn't even mean that anymore. But it used to mean learning Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. And that's really important. I discovered how important that was in grad school when I realized there was kind of a whole dimension of the tradition missing um, uh, in many cases, a, a simultaneous, you know, aspect of the tradition that's happening while the Greeks and Romans are, are writing alongside these guys. Um, and so, yeah, it's important that he, Hebrew is a classical language. So I did, I did learn it. All right. School. So, so he, I, I salute you, by the way, I only know Hebrew. I don't know Greek and Latin. I mean, it's my loss, obviously. So give me an example when I know that the West stands on Athens and Jerusalem, but mm. I far can better articulate how it stands on Jerusalem than I can on Athens. So tell me how it stands on Athens. Yeah. Okay. So these two traditions, I really believe, are kind of coming at uh, the same truths because truth is absolute and universal and as Edmund Burke says you know morality is not geographical um but the other thing that Edmund Burke says really beautifully throughout his work is that we come at these truths in a kind of embodied way we live them out in our traditions and in our our history and so here's an example of something that the west uh, i think really learns foundationally from Athens first um, and that is a concept which comes out of out of the Greek language, hylomorphism. Um, it's made out of two Greek words, hule, which is uh, just stuff, matter, and morphe, form. Um, in the Greek tradition, the Greek philosophical tradition, uh, it, really the whole thing kind of begins in the 5th century BC with the interjection of Socrates into a world of fashionable relativism, much like our world in that respect. It's very fashionable to hold the idea that there's no such thing as real, you know, stable, absolute truth. Um, Socrates introduces the proposition that there are eternal truths. We can progress toward knowledge of them. Plato, in memorializing Socrates, places those truths in some kind of higher plane, the realm of the forms, the realm of the ideas. But it's Aristotle who makes the brilliant, I think, observation that form and matter are always intertwined, that we never experience matter without shaping it into some kind of form. And in an interesting way, I think distantly your observation about music is indebted to this Aristotelian idea because it's perfectly true. Music without tone, atonal music isn't music. Why is that so? Why is a random sequence of tones not a piece of music? Because we don't simply judge by the part, we judge by the whole. We judge according to the totality, the form that our mind gives, the shape that our mind gives to everything, the shape that we have, which is which is called the soul. And this is what I kind of dig into in the body crisis section of the book, because I think it really answers a lot of the anxiety we're seeing and feeling in young people over the human body, over the sense that this flesh of ours is kind of a mistake and maybe you're born into the wrong sex, maybe you should be a robot, maybe uh, it's bad to have flesh at all. This is transhumanism, uh, which is kind of the next line of defense after transgenderism. And hylomorphism, which is kind of baked into our whole way of thinking, even if we don't know it, um, is the answer to this. And, and um, 
I've been now, now suggesting for a long time that this comes right out of Aristotle, and it, it does. I mean, that's a matter of history. Um, but it's interesting to note that the great expositor of hylomorphism in the uh, later medieval, in the medieval tradition is uh, Thomas Aquinas, the Christian, who believes that Aristotle here is in line with scripture, which is a kind of amazing thing. If you think about, you know, speaking of, of Hebrew, the moment in Genesis where God takes dirt, the Adam, and he breathes the nshamma, the, the breath of life in, um, and it becomes a nefesh chayim, a living soul in that union, in the moment of the union between kind of disembodied spirit and physical stuff. Neither one is alone enough to make a human being. Um, the combination of those two is perfectly hylomorphic. And so, you know, do we stand on Athens there or do we stand on Jerusalem? I would argue we, we stand on both because both are pointing us toward a foundational and, and urgent truth. Um, but as a matter of history, it's it's from Athens that we that we kind of really established. Well, idea. all right. I talk to you about Aristotle and God in a moment. The book is How okay. to Save the West. Extremely well written, easily digested profundities. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. As you know, I'm a big fan of ancient wisdom. I'm a big fan of modern wisdom, too. Wisdom is wisdom. And uh, your kids get no wisdom in almost any school they go to. None whatsoever. They get anti-wisdom. It started in the 60s. It started really 100 years ago, but it really came to fruition right after World War II. So he has an antidote, the book, How to Save the West, Ancient Wisdom for Five Modern Crises by Spencer Clavin. And indeed, your Hebrew is excellent. I knew the verses, oh, you, were, uh, I knew the verses you were citing. <laughs> glad to have passed the test. You did, you did <laughs> indeed. I subject you myself did, to it, but there we are. You didn't even know you were being tested. I didn't. So, I, I, I rarely I, do. I... <laughs> I I'm going to ask perhaps a naive question, but I don't care. I, I've always wondered about this, given Aristotle's brilliance and profundity. So he, he tell me, first of all, that I have the supposition correct. He believed in, in, a, in an unmoved mover, a creator who yes. did not take interest in his creation. Is that correct? Yes. The second part of that, the second way of saying that might uh, come under some dispute, but why don't, maybe let's ask the question and then I'll talk about the, whether it's the creator or the unmoved mover. Well, my question is not relevant if my supposition is not accurate. Oh, I see. Um, yes. Aristotle believed that all motion can be derived from the uh, action of an unmoved mover who is pure actus purus in the in the Latin of the medievals that he is pure action, um, and yeah, there there's a kind of detachment on the right. part of so this is, it does, divine does, mind. Does, yeah. If I said to Aristotle, "Do you believe in God?" and I wouldn't even mean the God of the Bible, just do you believe in God? What would he answer? I suspect he would say, I believe in the divine and that the divine is one and that the divine is conscious and is a mind. Um, I, I, I don't want to speak, put words in his mouth, but I think that's what he would say. So he, he believes that a, a conscious being, can I say the word being, created the world? Yep, an entity. A conscious uh, entity created the world. Yeah, I, I, you know, you're really testing me now, but I think the world has technically is is infinite, has no beginning and end. Right. Uh, so they're time, exactly. Yeah. So so right. Then then I don't understand. Given that the that his view is that the universe always existed, why would there even be a need for a creator? Uh, because there's change in the world. So. Uh, the view here, I think, would be that uh, time is not the only dimension, but outside of time, there stands uh, a, 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 a yeah, pure motion that kind of gives movement to all things. In, in the Maybe a, a good way to do this would be to think about a particular text, the, the metaphysics, where Aristotle sort of addresses this question, what is there besides matter, besides motion, change, time, physical extension, and space? 
And um, his basic problem, which is kind of the problem of Parmenides, is why does anything move at all? Uh, and that's what gets him out of materialism, because if there's just matter, it can't move itself. And um, it gets him into the realm of Plato's ideas, but he doesn't want uh, there to be a kind of purely abstracted space. So he says this is kind of like the, the, the fact of motion, the ultimate fact of, of change in the world. Is created, is made possible by this conscious entity. I, yeah, I think, I, I think that's right. Right. So, but the conscious entity did not start the world because it's always been here. Uh, yeah, but concepts like start, I think, for Aristotle in this in this uh, context have no meaning. Not for me, so, I should say. I'm not representing my own. No, no, I fully yeah. understand that. Right. So I acknowledge that it is impossible for those of us who believe in a God who created ex nihilo uh, from nothing. We can't right. understand what existed prior to the universe. What happened five minutes before the Big Bang is not accessible by our minds. But it is also not accessible that it always has been here. Always is as inaccessible as as began. Would Aristotle yep. acknowledge that what he believed was not intellectually accessible by a human being? I suspect he would. I mean, Aristotle is very, uh, he doesn't often get credit for this, but he's very uh, insightful. He's very good about the limits of uh, human discipline and human uh, conception and thought. Um, He has a a kind of a dictum in the Nicomachean ethics that we should seek the level of specificity in each discipline that the discipline itself admits of. And so he might say that this is a, a place at which until one achieves the status of uh, basically thought, contemplating thought, until one transcends beyond all speech and time, uh, one, okay. one can't really meaningfully. All right, we got a break. Yeah. How to Save the West. The book is up at DennisPrager.com. Spencer Clavin, while we're taking a break, go to ReliefFactor.com. Try the product for three weeks. If it doesn't work, cancel your order. Those are the suggestions actually of the maker of the product. You'll know in three weeks if it conquers your muscle or joint pain. Simple as that. Three weeks cost $19.95. It's hard for me to imagine you wouldn't try that to conquer your pain. Relieffactor.com, drug-free completely, 800-500-8384. Three-week quick start is nineteen ninety five. Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of Pragertopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at pragertopia.com.